like I said, we've been trying to do this interview for over a month now, and circumstances <laughs> always got in the way. But I finally have with me here the world-renowned James Corbett of the Corbett Report. And uh, by the way, I watched your speech uh, in France on redefining journalism, and uh, it just amazed me how you're able to stay so comfortable in front of such a loud, such a large crowd. Do you have any tips, or is it just something that comes with experience? Well, it might be a little bit of both, but uh, but the way I, I I put that in perspective is that although there were a lot of people in the room, there weren't nearly as many people as watch me online on a weekly basis. And it's harder for me to conceptualize that. I know there are tens of thousands of people watching my videos every week, but uh, it's hard to think of that. But when I look out in the room and I see 100 or 200 sets of eyes staring back at me, I can think, well, there's going to be 10 times or 20 times or 100 times more than that uh, watching online. So it kind of helps to uh, settle the nerves a bit yeah do you have like a mantra or something that you do or just something you do to get into the mood not at all the only thing i do is prepare as the the more prepared you are the less nervous you're going to be because you already know what you're talking about and plus that was a i mean that's a topic that i'm very very passionate about so i don't need a lot of prompting to be able to talk about it at length so so that definitely helps oh yeah for sure and i i did enjoy the speech it was very enlightening now, the, the topic and primary focus of my YouTube channel is always is ways in which the individual can reclaim his own education. You know, a lot of my target audience are dropouts, homeschoolers, and other people who've taken their education in their own hands. Now, what do you feel are some of the most important skills one should acquire to succeed on the path of self-education? <laughs> To be honest, the, the, probably the most important skill that I have is just the ability to look for and find information. And it should, I think, be one of the most basic skills that we learn, but it's definitely not one that we tend to learn um, in school, or at least it's not one that we learn the various ways of doing. When in school, we are basically taught that all information will come from a teacher or a textbook, and that if you don't regurgitate what you're told, um, you're doing it wrong. Whereas in real life, the most important skill that I have is just the ability to to search for information myself. And that can be as simple as learning how to use a search engine online. Um, and of course, I stay away from Google because of all the Big Brother overtones of that. Uh, but uh, whatever search engine people use, uh, just get used to looking for information for yourself and uh, thinking about different ways to find sources of information. Because uh, once you once you understand how to do that, uh, that's, that's the magic key that opens up uh, a world of information that uh, that otherwise wouldn't be there for you. So, uh, so my, my number one piece of advice is to stop relying on so-called sources of authority and start learning how to, to find the information for yourself. And once you do that, um, as I say, everything's open. The world is your oyster, as they say. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's very true. And one thing that I do notice, though, is that a lot of people, you know, through since we are all fed through a compulsory education system, a lot of people lose their natural interest for learning. You know, one thing that I, you know, I'm, I'm always curious and want to know more. So I'm always doing research. I'm always looking for more information. But a lot of the people I know and a lot of the people that I, you know, interact with on the, interact with on the daily basis, they're not so curious. It seems that a lot of the curiosity was removed from them at a very young age. And how much do you feel that comp compulsory schooling itself generates to the lack of respect? and interest in education among the younger people, you know, the whole culture of pick on the smart guy. I mean, right. right. you think that's just a product of the compulsory schooling or is that some innate human? Uh, no, I think it's a product of a lot of different cultural forces, but I think you're right. I mean, everyone is born with natural curiosity. I've got a seven month old son and he is curious about everything that he comes into contact with. And I think that is something that is very hard to drum out of people. People are naturally curious. They want to know about the world they're living in. How else can you do that other than forcing kids to go to some, some room where they have to listen to a teacher for hours and hours every single day, whether they want to be there or not, and they have to study one subject at a time. Time, the way they're told in the way in in the way that they're told um, that's that's a good way of trying to drum out that natural curiosity and getting people just to be robots rather than human beings who interact with the world in a spontaneous way so it is hard to overcome that and counteract that but I think there is still that spark of curiosity in everyone and once people start encountering real true raw information information that goes against what they're they're taught in the history books and and that shows for example that you know 50 years ago 
this month or last month, uh, the, the president of the United States had his head blown off in broad daylight by almost undoubtedly a conspiracy that involved some of the most powerful people in the country. That's kind of interesting information that will get people's attention, uh, more so than the types of uh, dry, cut and dry, boring um, revisionist history that they're taught in schools. So I think it's a combination of uh, showing people the real information, the real history that's being suppressed, and uh, getting people outside of that classroom environment where they're just listening to a teacher and getting them more involved with it. And, and that goes back to what we were saying before. Once people are starting to search for the information themselves and finding out how to do that, I don't think there's a way to turn the, uh, turn the, the curio curiosity switch into the off position. Because again, it's, it's there. It's underneath the surface. People just need to, to reignite that flame that's been put out with all of the monotonous schooling they've been given. Yeah, and it's also funny that the schools, since they understand that you're going to have this natural curiosity to go out and look for the information, they kind of give you the, you know, so like when you mentioned JFK and everything else, they kind of put you in the history class that you hate, that's going to be boring, but they give you the information so that when you encounter it later, you feel like, well, I already sat in so many years of schooling. I, I did my history class. I did my government class. We talked about it. So I know all there is to know. I'm qualified to speak on it. And, um, oh, go ahead. I, I just want to say that is so right. And that is exactly, I think, part of the problem is that we get all this information handed to us on a platter. Here it is. It's in the textbook. This is the history. Study this. Regurgitate it on a test and you're good. And so that that makes people into these kind of passive receptacles for information. They just sit there and they, they soak it in and they, they expect that's the way the world is going to work for them for the rest of their lives. And that's why people will, will go off to a factory or wherever and just listen to their boss and do what they're told and put their head down and work. And that's the only conception of, of the way the world uh, works that, uh, that these people have who have, who have sat there in those classrooms and been, uh, been subjected to that their whole lives. So, uh, so again, I, I hope that the, uh, the process of the alternative media is getting people into more active, uh, actively engaged people who are out there looking for their own information and searching out, uh, out uh, searching this out for themselves. Because again, once people get off the couch and start realizing that, uh, that they have to put something into it, they're going to get a lot more out of it. Yeah. And um, what is what is one story that you, that you did that you feel most importantly about getting out to the public? If there was one that you could get everyone to listen to, which would that be? I know that's a very tough question. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, there's so much. Um, it's really hard to narrow it down. And so anything I choose, I'll, I'll, I'll regret later. Oh, I should have chosen this or that. But uh, but something that occurred to me recently is uh, I, I w uh, recently had the chance to talk to uh, to NSA whistleblower Russ Tice. And he is uh, he was was with the NSA uh, over a decade ago, and he um, was one of the, in fact, the first uh, public whistleblower from the NSA. And during this whole Edward Snowden affair, um, he came out and was was attempting to spill some more information about what he knew. In fact, he had firsthand experience of some of the NSA wiretaps that were done against uh, specific politicians um, and judges and high-ranking military officials. The NSA have been watching these people for at least a decade, listening in specifically specifically wiretapping individuals, including a then relatively unknown senator from Illinois named Barack Obama. So um, the NSA is uh, one of the things about this whole surveillance grid that isn't getting reported on a lot is that a lot of this is turned inwardly into the into the uh, the American uh, government itself, because obviously knowledge is power. The knowledge to blackmail people is power. And if people look into the real history of the FBI, the reason that J. Edgar Hoover was able to maintain his position as director of the FBI for half a century is because he had the goods on everyone. He had the files with all of the information, all of the dirt on all of the politicians that he got from his FBI agents. And he had a special, uh, his own special file repository of all this information. And so he could say to anyone who was trying to threaten his position, hey, I've got the goods on you. And that's how he maintained his position of power. Imagine how much more power the NSA has over the American people right now, uh, the American government, quote unquote, right now, because they have the goods on everyone, everything that's done electronically. They have they have it stored away, and uh, and this is I think the real underlying uh, threat of the NSA spying story that isn't being reported on so much because people are are focusing solely on Edward Snowden. So I hope. I wish people would uh, would take a look more at that uh, Russell Tice information, not just my interview, but uh, there's been interviews uh, that he's done with some other outlets as well that are worth listening to. Yeah, and you're also right about how the public is not taking the information about the wiretapping and the NSA spying on the public uh, so seriously. And one, one 
common response that I get from a lot of people when you bring up anything about the NSA spying or any of the new information that's being released with the Snowden case or what you just mentioned, the first thing they say is, well, we already know the government was spying on everybody. You know, we already knew that. So how is that any significant? What, what's the difference now? Why, why does it matter so much? And what would be one response, one short response you would have for someone who said that to you? Well, if someone already knew about this, then that's great. Then this information really isn't uh, isn't for them. But uh, but the point is, what are you going to do about this? And I think that this is, really puts the ball in the people's court once again, because you can't deny what's going on anymore. And it's funny because I've I, all I heard years ago when I was talking about the NSA spying on everyone was, oh, that's just conspiracy theory. Now that it's proven fact, everyone goes, oh, well, we already knew that. Um, it's just a way of people trying to avoid the the um, the responsibility of doing something with this information and again i think it comes down to what we can do individually to at the very least um make it more difficult for them to to spy on us to try to get off of the uh, the, the spying grid as it were and that's a difficult thing to do it means uh, not not giving into the latest shiny eye thing and uh, and the fondle slabs and the things that people are so attached to that are make it so much easier for the uh, the nsa to do its job and now that they're starting to implement the fingerprint scanners and everything else um it, we're just getting top further and further into this matrix and largely we're doing it to ourselves we are actually paying to to be put into this matrix so i th i think people have to if they're already aware of the nsa spying good great for them but the point is what are you going to do about it and i think we have to take this to the next level and really start boycotting the system on mass and uh, and for looking for alternatives in in open source software and hardware and and everything else we can do to get outside of this matrix yeah, and speaking on open source software, hardware, and journalism, what is your opinion on Bitcoin? I know you've probably seen all of the recent developments and everything else, and I haven't seen you put out anything, any official statement or any opinion on, on Bitcoin or what you in the future as far as a decentralized currency that's with widespread use. Right. Well, I, I wrote an editorial about this that's available on the International Forecaster website, so I'll direct people there if they're interested in more on it. But but basically, my long and short is that I, I don't think it's going to be the savior of humanity, but I don't think it's uh, it's the sign of the coming of Satan or anything that, uh, that some people say. I, I take a, a kind of more middle-of-the-road approach. I think it's one of many possible complementary currencies that people should be looking into to try to get off the Federal Reserve note system or whatever it may be in whatever country people are listening to this in um, because uh, obviously I think the worst of all possible worlds is the debt-based money printed from nothing which is uh, what's what the American economy and basically every other economy in the world is is running on these days and the solution to this is to try to get off of that grid and onto some of the many 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 possible other currencies that exist out there Bitcoin is one of them sure um, there are other cryptocurrencies and virtual currencies like quarks and others that people should be looking into and there are other actual real physical currencies that people should look into including things like Ithaca hours and the uh, the other hours and let systems and things like that that already exist in a lot of cities around the US and a lot of countries around the world people just don't know about these alternative and complementary currencies because they think hey I've got these these dollar bills and they, they work anywhere I want to go so uh, so why would I bother with anything else but I think people are waking up to the fact that uh, the entire economy is being completely run into the ground on purpose and uh, and the 2000 eight Lehman Brothers collapse was just one sign of what's uh, what's possible and unfortunately what's going to happen if people continue giving their time money effort and energies into the pursuit of these uh, little meaningless pieces of paper these Federal Reserve notes that aren't worth the paper they're printed on or more increase or more or more uh, more to the point these days they're not even printed they're just virtual uh, bits and bytes so uh, so Bitcoin is one of those uh, those methods I wouldn't rely on it for I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket because again it relies on the the internet infrastructure and Hey, I mean, it, with a flip of the switch, you you go from being a Bitcoin millionaire to to zero uh, overnight. So I, I wouldn't put all of my uh, my my eggs in that basket. But it's it's one place that people should be looking to to see what they can do to subvert the system. And it is good to be able to uh, to send funds um, across borders and around the world with without the the, uh, the 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 interference of various central banks and, and government authorities. So we'll see how long this lasts and how long uh, the, the people are able to to circumvent the system like this but while it's around people should be trying to make the most of it yeah yeah that's definitely a very good answer and yeah that's what people should keep in mind because it is kind of a little risky right now since it's based on 
a lot of stuff that the government has influence over. Now, what do you? How much credence do you give to the whole idea of a third world war, or do you? Are you with the camp that it's already begun and we just haven't felt the impact yet? What do you think about that whole topic? Well, I mean, we're certainly not in a hot war, but I do see the development of maybe a 21st century narrative that's similar to the 20th century narrative of the uh, Cold War with the Soviets. Now we have the uh, the Chicoms, the Chinese, uh, which, of course, uh, again, I think just like the 20th century Cold War is a very manipulated uh, situation where the Soviet Union was very much supported and uh, and funded and fostered by some of the uh, the monopoly capitalists who now these days are, are uh, setting up the infrastructure structure for to become the rising giant of the 21st century and it's the same thing happening we start to see the ratcheting up of tensions bit by bit with the, some of the island disputes in the east china sea and now this air defense identification zone that china's trying to implement and and uh, it's just bit by bit it becomes more and more of a, uh, a a pressing reality on the american psyche as the uh, pentagon looks for excuses to continue uh, their their unbelievable budget and now they're starting to shift over to the asia pacific so i do see the beginnings of some sort of Cold War scenario. I don't know if it's going to become a hot war or not, but uh, with every ratcheting up of the tensions, all it takes is for one one incident, and who knows how that can uh, escalate beyond what he, he, what anyone is predicting or expecting, um, especially with things like air defense identification zones and someone flies a B-52 into that zone, and you know who knows what's going to happen. So uh, so it's a it's a possibility. I don't discount it. I don't think it's in the near future. I don't think that's on the cards. But uh, but again, one never knows how these situations can get out of control and it's something that i think the people should be uh, should be concerned about and we should be working on every front to demilitarize as much as possible and go against these uh, military build-ups that are unfortunately happening around the globe right now yeah that's that's very true and that's a uh, yeah that pretty much puts it all into perspective in, into how we should be looking at the situation but uh one other question that I had and knowing that you're in Japan and you're closer to the situation than everyone else and I'm pretty much hitting on the topics that I haven't really you know got a definitive answer from a lot of watching a lot of your videos and a lot of people have questions about which I have find a tough time myself and one topic since you're in Japan is Fukushima which is what how how um, well how seriously do you think people should take it knowing that you're living pretty close to it is it as bad as everyone says it is or are people hyping up the radiation or is it really not that serious and it's mostly under control? What do you think well, I, I would say somewhere in the middle. I, I All I see online is people who say either this is the end of humanity, everything's uh, going to hell, we're all dead, or there are people who say everything's fine, sunshine, sunshine and lollipops and roses. Yeah, exactly. So so I, I think that the reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, we can't obviously trust what the government of TEPCO is saying wholeheartedly because they have been caught lying and withholding information time after time. And one of the latest bits is that uh, TEPCO has just in the last couple couple of weeks admitted, oh, by the way, the uh, the fuel rod uh, uh, storage, the spent fuel pool in Reactor 4 was damaged, and it's been damaged for a couple of decades now, but we didn't tell you about that before. Um, we're just letting you know now. Um, so again, we can't trust what they're saying. But on the other side of it, there are the people who are saying, basically, Japan is a nuclear wasteland, everyone's going to die. And I don't, I don't see that, um, certainly not right now, the way things are. That could change on a dime. Um, and right now, they are trying to remove some of the spent fuel rods from uh, Fukushima Unit 4, the spent fuel pool there that uh, that building has been listing and it's it's been a precarious situation. So they're trying to move the fuel rods out into some state safer storage. That's a very delicate process and there's a lot that could go wrong there. And there are people like Arnie Gunderson and others who say that if, if that does go wrong, um, that could release more radiation into the atmosphere than all of the nuclear testing from the 1970s onwards combined. So, so there's a lot uh, on the table. And um, and I, there are causes for concern, but whether this is a kind of the uh, the end of humanity as we know it, oh, well, obviously I'm here in Japan. I don't think it is the end of humanity, um, and I think that there are things that we can do to be safer and, and protect ourselves um, from this, including what my family here does. Basically, we do not eat um, seafood of any sort unless we know exactly where it's coming from, and it's coming from the other side of the world. Um, I'm not trusting anything that's fished off of Japan right now because, uh, again, I just don't trust that they're labeling it properly or telling us properly where it's from. So, so we 
don't eat uh, seafood, which is a pretty difficult thing to do in Japan because um, that's a huge part of the diet here. But but it's what we're doing to uh, to try to protect ourselves. And I think that uh, people on the West Coast of the United States should at least be thinking about it. And I'm uh, I, I, there's there's a lot of information out there about some of the dangers. And in fact, I just posted something up to Fukushima Update dot com from Washington's blog, uh, just a really well done essay that goes into a lot of the information about what people on the West Coast of the United States should be worrying about and or not worrying about when it comes to radiation from Fukushima. Yeah. So any any projects that you're working on for the near future that, you know, you want to let the people know about or... Sunday. Yes, yes. Actually, we just started. Uh, I do a weekly video report for BoilingFrogsPost.com, the website of uh, FBI whistleblower Sibel Edmonds. And we have just started a new video series. It's going to be a weekly video series, but right now we're just... Yeah, exactly. We're just... I've seen the pilot episode right now. Yeah, well, I'm really excited about this. Uh, we just started it, as you say, just the pilot episode, and we're just starting to test the different formats and different ways that we can do it. But basically, myself, Sibel Edmonds, Peter B. Collins, and we're going to have some guests on from time to time to basically discuss in a, in a you know, just a conversational manner some of the, the biggest issues. And uh, we're not always going to agree. There's going to be disagreements, and uh, we're going to just put everything out on the table. So I'm pretty excited about that series. Uh, people who are interested can find out more at boilingfrogspost.com. Obviously, it's up on my site as well. Okay, well, any last words, anything you want to shout out, your website or anything else like that for the, for the listeners of my show? Not really, just uh, people can follow all my work at CorbettReport.com, and I just want to uh, to take uh, a moment to put, take my hat off to you, yourself and everyone else out there who's trying to put this information out there to the public, because uh, again, I think it has to come down to each of us individually, and I always say I, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be doing this for a living. Um, I never intended to do it, but just one day I realized that I had a part to say in all of this and a part to play, and I think everyone out there does. Um, maybe not podcasts maybe not this type of work but everyone has a part to play in at least uh, going out there and finding the information for themselves so that's what I always want to leave it on and I think uh, we can create our own reality we can create a better reality by simply getting involved rather than just being passive recipients so that's my message for everyone all right mr. James Corbett thank you for your time and I'm glad we finally got to do this interview and uh... I appreciate it man anytime